Thank you, Chris. Great, great job. So uh, it's great, great honor to introduce Keith tonight. Uh, you know, uh, we're really fortunate to have Keith uh, working in our state. You know, uh, you know, I go way back working with DNR for at least 27, 28 years as long as we've been an organization. And uh, Dr. Burt Pittman was a great, great friend of mine. We spent a lot, many, many hours botanizing all over the state. And again, so, and DNR has served as our uh, key source for native plant information, protection, et cetera. So it's a great honor here to have Keith here with us tonight. So Keith Bradley is a botanist specialized in, the, in plant species and ecosystems of the Southeast United States and the Caribbean. He is a state botanist in the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, SCDNR, an affiliate and faculty of the University of South Carolina and with the AC Moore Herbarium. He has been active in the regional conservation community for 30 years, working on a broad array of biological conservation research in land management and plant planning issues. He grew up in Miami, Florida, and his work in Florida on recovery of endangered species and their habitats has led to two awards from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, including the Regional Leader in Recovery Award in 2008 and in the Coastal Pro Program for Conservation Partnership Award in 2010. He is widely considered the expert in flora of the Southeast, and he has been with DNR on going on three years. So please give me a warm welcome to Dr. Keith Bradley. Did you put the doctor? Yeah, I did. Okay. <clears throat> I need to mute him. No, no. Okay. All right. Today's weird. I love doing talks. I have fun. Usually, it's a meditative process. Sit down, first, look through all your slides. Let's get into slide show if you have. That's a lot of fun. And then we'll look up the morning and see what's what. So, there is no meditative time to get up from that time. So, we're going to um, I love doing this. Uh, I got another new for me for people I grew up with so since I was 11 years old. Who knew me as a little kid? <laughs> so I will get up. So it's, it's been really cool. Um, as I give this, as I talk, uh, feel free to ask questions. I don't think you see this, I just like. I don't want to. <laughs> so, anyways, I came into DNR at, a, at, a, at an unusual time. I've been here for three years uh, as a state botanist. And, and as Rick talked about, we, we've got a great legacy at DNR of really good botanists, starting with Doug Rayner in the 1970s and Burt Pittman, and with them, Kathy Boyle and Herrick Brown. And then all of our botanists left DNR. We had to retirements. Herrick Brown went on to get his PhD and go to the University of South Carolina. And so I was hired to come in um, at an opportune time to rebuild the program and re-envision re it and hire great new people who I'll talk about in a little while too. And so um, that's how I've landed here today. I'm also an alumni. I grew up in Miami, Florida. I'm an alumni of the Native Plant Society. I've been really active with the Native Plant Society now in South Carolina, but a lot of my history was in Florida with the Kunti chapter of the Native Plant Society in, in Miami and, and on the state board of directors as well. Um, so, no. Better? So, all right. I like to walk around. <laughs> I like to be free and unfettered when I'm doing this. So, so what I wanted to talk to you about today was kind of the, what the DNR's botany program is doing about the special floor that we've got in South Carolina that DNR and other groups like you guys are trying to protect. So we have a long-term botanical legacy here. Um, it's a really special floor that makes us make South Carolina a special place. Despite what you say, Wanda, it's a great place. And my clicker is not working for a change. There we go. Well, if I'm standing back here anyways. IT, IT. It works. 
<laughs> it worked before. <laughs> so many times. Does it? Here we go. I think you just click this. Ah, one. exciting. Is that awesome. working now? You're great. All right. So I've already told you who I am. I'm the state biologist. I've been here for three years. And what I'm trying to do is not only build a botany program, um, but build a plant conservation program. I'm going to talk about all the, the different things that we're active in as a collectively as an agency. You're good. You're good. So we have to be historians, and that's why it's so exciting to be a botanist. We're not just out there looking at plants all the time. We're looking at old books and old maps. And this was a fascinating one to me. And we we have hints of our botanical legacy gifted to us by some of the early explorers of South Carolina. If you look at this map, there are a couple of weird things. It's not very the resolution is not very good. But Columbia, the Midlands is here, and look at this zone right here. Deserta Arenosa, a sandy desert, right there on the fall line of South Carolina. That's our fall line sandhills ecosystem. And then you guys in the upstate, you can see the mountains here, right at the base of the mountains, this savanna, depicted by early early settlers right below the escarpment. What's that? It's, there's some creative license. I think it's I think it's more that way. So, so these are kind of the things we, we think or try to look at when we want to do plant conservation in South Carolina. What have, we in, what have we lost? What have we inherited? And where can we go with it? IT, IT. I had a talk, I gave a talk once, a very formal talk, where all of my images disappeared. Help. What did you do before? That right? Wow. That was there we go. There we go. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. No worries. All right. I'm here. <laughs> so here in the upstate, we've got hints at a beautiful a Piedmont prairie ecosystem that we've mostly lost. Mm -hmm. Frequently burned habitats in the between the fall line sand hills and the mountains that we only see little hints of these days, especially on roadsides or in a couple of little restoration areas. And we've lost a lot of species from that, from that ecosystem, things like Georgia aster <clears throat> and our fall line ecosystems, which is heavily developed, for example, in the Columbia area. Beautiful desert-like ecosystems with longleaf pine sand hills and turkey oaks. And you're a native plant enthusiast, so you know the physiography of the state very well. But I also gave this talk to master gardeners, so I wanted to give a brief overview. We've got every, we've got a, our, we've got such a rich diversity of native plants because of the landscape diversity here. Everything from the maritime strand, the coastal plain, which is very recent geological sediments, the fall land sand hills, depositions from erosion of the mountains, the sea level where the sea level. Uh, never overtopped the Piedmont, rolling hills, and then the very ancient Appalachian Mountains. And we've also got a cultural legacy in our flora that's really important both to Native Americans and to us in preserving our current flora. Um, Native Americans had vast influences on our native vegetation. They were doing burning, they were doing farming, they were bringing things from other parts of the world, such as the Caribbean, they were trading species. They influenced what we have now and some of what we've lost. And we build that into our conservation programs. Part of our flora is a legacy of who was here before us. So for example, we've got Native American shell rings and shell middens on the coast. These are all relatively recent, several thousand year old geological features created by Native Americans. They're really important to our archeologists doing excavations, learning about who was here before us, but they also host a really unusual flora. So for example, look at these shell ring complexes. For example, our Heritage Trust Program protects, protects South Bluff Heritage Preserve in Beaufort County. 
we've got this little shrub, Godfrey's privet, Forestieri God, Forest Godfrey, which is only in South Carolina on the shell middens and shell rings. Nowhere else in South Carolina. So a novel ecosystem created by people that host a really unusual flora. And our cultural program is active in protecting those kind of habitats, but the botany team is as well. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. <clears throat> this is a species restricted to calcareous sediments throughout its range. It's extreme, extremely rare throughout its range, only from Florida, one site in Georgia, and about half a dozen here. And we talk about what we're protecting and Sam and I, Sam and I deal with this every day. <laughs> We've got about 3,000 kinds of native plants. We get into little battles with our other tax experts at DNR uh, about conserving species because to hurt reptile people, they've only got, what, 100 species or so. We've got 3,000 species of native plants to deal with and about 1,000 exotic species that are naturalized. These are our indigenous species that have been here long before us. And we've got hints at how we define what something is as native or not. And we get into fist fights about it sometimes. It's hard to figure out if something's native sometimes, but we've got a lot of historical data. For example, illustrations of, of bald cypress here with um, Carolina parakeet. We look at a lot of old, old literature and our uh, botanical uh, influencers from the 1600s and 1700s, Mark Catesby doing paintings of our native plants. And we're still figuring out some of the things, the identification of species that he painted, things like pond spice, Herrick, all, Herrick Brown at the university just had a, a vision one day and realized what he had painted. And, and uh, we figured it out. Uh, Bill Bartram, Thomas Walter, who was in the middle of the Santee um, Delta and wrote the first flora of South Carolina, Walter's flora, flora carolinea, without any botanical training on his own. He wrote a Latin flora that described for the first time a lot of our native plant species, things like Carolina birds in a nest. Um, absolutely amazing piece of work. Andre Michaud, Stephen Elliott, based in Charleston, also wrote a very early flora. And we're still learning a lot from their early works in the 1700s and 1800s. And this is just part of a fun part of this, part of the, the presentation. If we think about the flora of South Carolina, what do we have? We've got a lot of little sedges and, and things that Samantha and I get all geeky about, but we've also got our iconic species like cabbage palms on the coast. It, it's on our state flag, it's on our state symbol. We think about South Carolina when we think about cabbage palms. It's on a flag on the outside of my house. I, keystone species like longleaf pines that aren't just a single tree species in the ecosystem, they're they're a foundation for that ecosystem. There are things like red cockaded woodpeckers that nest primarily in that single pine species. It, it influences the functions of the whole ecosystem by providing leaf litter, neater fall that carries fires, which in, influences the hundreds and hundreds of native plant species, wildflowers and grasses and sedges and shrubs that grow underneath the longleaf pines that are only there because of the frequent fires all supported essentially because of the single pine species. We've got endemic species. These are the things that nobody else can say they have except us as South Carolinians. We've got May White Azalea. Charles Horn at Newberry College has been studying this a lot of his career. He's got about 70 sites for it, 70 to 80 sites for it in South Carolina. He has yet to find it outside of South Carolina. And it is an amazing species, uniquely South Carolinian. You can smell it if you walk into the woods in May. You're not even anywhere close to it. You can smell it through the woods and it kind of draws you in and leads you to it. <clears throat> Rhododendron East Manii. And then we've got things that are narrow endemics um, that we really care about because they're globally rare where South Carolina is part of the range. So we've got this, what most people think of as this almost alien plant, Venus flytraps. Venus flytrap is currently only known in South Carolina from Horry County. It used to be in Georgetown County. It may have been in Berkeley or Charleston County. Um, otherwise, only in a few counties in North Carolina, where it is more common there. We're, it's on its last legs here, so we're working hard to protect it here. We've got three big pop, three populations of it, essentially. We've got it on three properties two of which we manage ourselves. 
And we care about these because they're our heritage. Um, these grow nowhere else on earth and they're our responsibility. The plant life of the place you live and talk about Wanda where I, we grew up in Miami, I feel at home in Miami because of the woods that I grew up playing in. It's you get, if you've grown up hunting, if you've grown up fishing, even if you don't care a thing about chlorophyll, you get a sense of your belongings because of the plant life around you. Their forms, their smells, just the shades of green. So if you go to Myrtle Beach and you're seeing things planted from other parts of the world, that's not real South Carolina. That could be duped, copycatted anywhere with a similar climate. South Carolina is South Carolina because of these species, even if you're not perfectly aware of them when you're walking around the woods. And they support the wildlife that is special here too. Unfortunately, as much as we love these things, we've got a lot of challenges. And as much as us botanists love walking in the, around in the woods, looking at pretty wildflowers, uh, we also get sad a lot. I'm gonna drink some water. No, it's distracting. Yes, sir. Is it true that um, there's more carnivorous species, plant species in the um, southeastern North Carolina and northeastern South Carolina in that area? This is this is why I hire other experts. Um, I don't know the numbers. We've got an extremely high diversity of genera. So Saracenia pitcher plants, Venus flytrap, butterworts, um, utricularias, the bladderworts. Um, so in terms of, we've got a big, a high number of, of species and genera, and there are other species rich genera like Nepenthes, but in terms of geography, I'm not, per if you've seen that, written, it might very well be true because somebody looked into it, unless it was on the internet, because everything on the internet's wrong, right? So, do you know, Sam? No, um, but I feel like it can't be. Yeah, I mean, it can't be. Australia, Australia has a, Australia has a really high diversity of Drosaros, for example. Madagascar, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and we'll go to his, um, so yeah, don't know, but we still like what we have. <laughs> and some of our, and some of our carn carnivorous plants are, are highly localized endemics, like sweet mountain pitcher plants, Saracenia jonesy eye on a few mountain fens in the, in the escarpment of North Carolina and South Carolina. So we've also got a high level of endemism and some of that genetic diversity is still being uncovered and species limits. <laughs> So we've had a lot of problems as part of the reason we have jobs as botanists to do conservation. So we've not only inherited that flora of about 3000 species and we don't know what we lost, but people who were here before us, European settlers have made dramatic changes to the landscape. And I know all of you in this room know that, but we've got a legacy, for example, on the coast of rice plantations, which is radically altered one of my favorite ecosystems, the freshwater tidal marsh. And of course, not only are there historical changes because of rice culture, but because of sea level rise and global and climate change problems. The, our ecosystems in the Piedmont have been radically changed because of cotton agriculture and erosion, poor farming pro, pro, practices and erosion. And we've shifted from kind of a king cotton ecosystem, agricultural system to now, we are almost a loblolly pine state. And we don't like loblolly pines for the most part. <laughs> They're very weedy species. They tend to dominate a lot of our coastal plain in Piedmont and now even some of our mountain ecosystems. And we look at a, pro <laughs> a lot of properties for acquisition and I can look on an aerial and say, yeah, we don't even want to do a site visit because it's been converted, it's been bedded and planted to Loblawi and all of it made look like a pretty forest driving down the road, but the biodiversity is extremely low. So we've radically changed a lot of our coastal plain and Piedmont for one species. We're also all here together and there are more and more of us every day. And 
There's not much we can do about that, but we've got places like this that are getting harder and harder to manage. Does anybody know where this is? Yeah, it's Horry County. So that is Lewis Ocean Bay Heritage Preserve. Um, highest, unless Samantha is outpacing me somewhere, highest diversity of rare plant species of any of our state heritage preserves right there on that 10,000 acre property, including Venus flytraps. It was, when it was first bought, it was thought to be out in the middle of nowhere. And now it's being surrounded by development, which means it's getting harder for us to manage because it's harder for us to do prescribed burns. It's harder for us to manage all the people. We want people to use our properties, but we have to manage the impacts of those people. We have to deal with more threats of invasive plant species coming from the neighborhoods. We have to deal with hydrological problems because the water table, table is also changing. But most importantly, fire. We have to be able to burn and that population density makes it hard to burn. It's absolutely integral to our historic landscapes from the coastal plain all the way into the mountains. We think of it as a coastal plain thing, but it was really a, a dominant part of a landscape all the way across the state. One of our other big challenges to biodiversity, protecting biodiversity are invasive plant species. This was a field trip I did to one of our heritage preserves on the coast, looking for a rare shrub. And I topped over a levee on the intracoastal waterway and saw giant reed, the Phragmites, uh, Phragmites australis, a, a Eurasian species dominating um, an impoundment. These other than prescribed fire, are the, one of the biggest threats to biodiversity other than development as well. We have other kinds of invasive species other than invasive plant species. We've got invasive pathogens. Does anybody know what this is? Sam does. You're not allowed to say. <laughs> chestnut, American chestnut. So across a lot of the southern apple, a lot of the Appalachians into South Carolina, ecosystem structures have changed over the last century because of fungal pathogens, and these are still appearing. We've got um, the legacy of chestnut blight. Samantha often still sees chestnuts, I think, walking around in the upstate with little root suckers, hardly ever flowering, much less fruiting. Um, but we've still got things like red, like laurel wilt that is affecting our coastal ecosystems and a lot of our Carolina bays by killing off swamp bay and red bay. So these pathogens keep causing problems and changing ecosystem structures. <clears throat> so I don't like to just talk about what's bad. I wanna to try to find a way to do something about it. Um, and that's why Samantha and I are tired all the time. So where do we go from here? We know the problem, once we've identified the problems, we can try to find some things to do about it. Fortunately, the plant conservation field is a very populated field these days. This was a meeting um, about the first month into my job at DNR at the Atlanta Botanical Garden. We have a lot of people like the Native Plant Society active in doing ecosystem management and rare plant conservation. So it's a really exciting time. <clears throat> and this is my team. And I got to say, I usually say this at the beginning, but this would seem like a good segue because these are the people that are doing it with DNR. Um, me, a horrible picture. I didn't, this is one of the only sides I didn't create. So I had no, I had no say in this. Samantha, I'm, I just have to expound praise on every single one of these people. Samantha Tessel has been with us for two years, came from North Carolina. She's our upstate botanist. So she is in your neighborhood and she is one of the best botanists in the Southeast. Eric Ungberg is brand new. He's our low country botanist. He just started April 1st and he lives in Georgetown. Another just phenomenal, phenomenal botanist. He knows, like Samantha, the flora backwards and forwards. And Chilla is our data specialist. She's inside the office most of the time, helping us get all the data that we're collecting and all the legacy data from herbarium specimens and citizen science projects like iNaturalist into our database. Um, the amount of data coming into DNR's Heritage Trust program right now is astounding. So we started our database in the 1970s mostly importing herbarium specimen data and Doug Rayner's data. In 2000, we had about 9,000 records in our database. We are now adding about 3,000 a year because so much data is coming in. And if you're finding rare plants, talk to Sam, talk to me, put them on iNaturalist. We want your data because that helps us plan conservation and do conservation and helps us do things like buy properties. If we know where these things are, we can do something about it. 
We can burn the places. We can control exotic plants. It's really important for us to have. So talk to us, give us your data. So we're involved in a lot of things. We've got trying to prioritize what species so we're working on. We buy properties to, um, for, for conservation. We do rare plant surveys and floristic surveys. That's the fun part of our job. We do ecosystem management, working with the people that do bigger projects. We do we help guide smaller projects and help guide them. We do rare plant reintroductions. Um, we do ecosystem restorations. And we're even got our hand in naming a few new species, which I'll talk about. So our focus is on globally imperiled species for the most part. So I said we've got about 3,000 native plants in South Carolina. That's a lot to manage. <laughs> So what we are doing, Samantha and Eric and the team are in the process of looking at every single one of those 3,000 species and putting a conservation rank on it from one to five. One is, it's in bad shape. We don't like ones, but those are the ones that get a lot of attention. These are, if we call something an S1, it means it's critically imperiled and generally they're about less than five populations in the state. It's on its last legs. We've got several hundred S1s in South Carolina, but of those S1s, um, we also look not only how it's doing in South Carolina, but how it's doing globally. So we end up with things like this, Shealy's mountain lettuce, which is known from basically one population, two rocks. You be quiet. <laughs> there are some taxonomic quirks that Samantha is working on, but the currently published data on this indicates that it's only known from one meta population in the world not far from your house. So that if it goes extinct on this one rock, two rocks, it's globally extinct. High, really high priority for conservation for us, especially if they're on our property. That one is not, but here are two that are. So we've got Rainer's blueberry, which was named by DNR's first botanist, Doug Rainer. And the common name, he didn't make up the common name, somebody else did. He didn't name it after himself. Vaccinium sempervirens. Adorable little shrub, only in Lexington County, South Carolina, nowhere else in the world. And it's protected on two heritage preserves, Shealy's Pond um, and Peachtree Rock Heritage Preserve. If we are the only public steward of that species. Similarly, Carolina hedge nettle, named by my dear friend, John Nelson, only known from two populations in the world, right on the coast on two DNR properties, Yawkey Center and Santee Coastal Reserve. And unfortunately, it's right on the coast where there are threats of sea level rise. Fortunately, this one's really easy to cultivate. So, um, but we're working on trying to find new populations and we haven't yet. We do, we're very active in doing acquisitions. We've been, the Heritage Trust Program was founded in the 1970s. Rick was on their board of directors for a long time. Uh, it was one of the first heritage pro programs in the country. We're really proud of that. It started by the Nature Conservancy and started by DNR in 1976, taken over by DNR in 1976. Um, we buy not only properties for pr protection of natural resources, but cultural resources. So we've got places like Point Set Bridge Heritage Preserve um, or Fort Lamar Heritage Preserve on the coast. Or, But there's a lot of overlap between what we're buying for natural and cultural resources because a lot of our cultural sites have significant natural resources. So Samantha and I spend a lot of time on there. Everybody goes to look at points at bridge, but Samantha climbs up the mountain to look at the rare plants. So we've got about 77 heritage preserves in the state, and we're really, really proud of that. These are some of the most special places that we have, and you should all go to as many of them as possible. Um, we've protected over 111,000 acres. Um, 61 of those are natural area heritage reserves and 18 are cultural heritage reserves, but a lot of those cultural sites have pretty awesome ecosystems too. Um, mo almost all of them are open to the public. They're all on our website, maps of where they are. Um, go to them as much as possible and help us take care of them. Um, you can hunt on some of them. So we spent almost $53 million on buying these properties. But we've also leveraged a lot of funds from other agencies and partners. So it's actually ended up, we've leveraged over $86 million in funds to get these properties as well. But it costs it, it costs the agency itself $53 million. And there they are. Go to them. And some of my some of the, I I I'm so lucky to have a job where I can go to these every day um, because they are 
you know, they are just some of the best places in the state. So I couldn't be happier. I couldn't have a better job. Um, That's great, Matt. It is, and it's growing. This doesn't even have the Slater tract, which we just bought last Friday. Protect gopher tortoises in Jasper County. Uh, that yeah. Like in progress. Yes, but we can't talk about them yet. <laughs> Secret. Yes, coming soon to a protection network near you. Yes, you'll see signs up someday. So, but fortunately, it's a big field of people protecting land. Um, we've got federal agencies like the National Park Service and the U.S. Forest Service protecting properties. We've got state agencies like state parks and state forests, counties and municipalities. We've got over 1.2 million acres of conservation land in South Carolina. And the last time I gave this talk, somebody asked me what percentage of the land that was, and I don't know. And I never calculated it, so I just remembered. This is the fun part of our jobs, me, Samantha, and Eric. We're running around the field to all of our heritage preserves. This is what I did. This map hasn't been updated. The first two years of my job, nobody knew who I was yet because it was COVID, and I spent all of my time outside. <laughs> it was great. Email almost didn't exist. Um, when we are, we're not just out there having fun. Well, we are, but that... <laughs> But the point of this is that we are we're reinventing what we think of as rare in South Carolina because of all the data we're looking at that's been collected since the 1970s. And so as we go to each property, we are mapping the rare plant species. We've got new technology, high precision GPS units. So we can map those rare plant species with great precision so the land managers know where they are. We figure out their conservation needs. It's not just like there's a little white iriset over there. It's been there since 1995. What can we do to help it out? Um, so we want to work with uh, site managers, um, people like Austin Pickhart up here, um, Johnny Stowe, Hunter Young, um, and doing other things like evaluating whether sites need prescribed fire, whether there are invasive plant species that are invading. We're finding new invasive plant species in the state all the time. I did a day of field work last week and found three new invasive species for South Carolina, including air potato an old Florida enemy. I, I'm finding all of my old enemies from Florida are coming up he, from here. And I'm not talking about you guys. <laughs> Plants. So this is an example of kind of uh, a, a data set um, that we started with uh, just a couple of years ago. So this is Chestnut Ridge Heritage Preserve. Um, these big circles are GPS points with error around them. So we know somebody found a rare plant somewhere within that giant circle, but it wasn't very precise. These are a little bit more precise. These are probably white iriset populations, Cicerinchium dichotomum. However, Samantha, armed with her fierce determination and her GPS unit and lack of sleep has done this in the last couple of years because she has been crawling all over Chestnut Heritage Preserve so she's mapping things with extremely high precision. She's surveying all the habitats. She's mapping some species as polygons. She's doing amazing things like finding Appalachian meadow root as new to South Carolina, the first time it was ever found here, I think. Maybe. There, there's a unverified, unspecimen record yes. from Oconee County. Yes. But Samantha documented for sure. She nailed, she nailed it down. She's got it. We've got new species that we had never tracked before that once we started to look at the data, we realized this is really rare and we need to start paying attention to it. So Allegheny Stonecrop, she mapped it at Chestnut Ridge. Autumn Goldenrod, this gorgeous goldenrod, about the fourth time it was ever found in the state, right there on a beautiful rock outcrop on Chestnut Ridge. Yeah. But extremely rare in South Carolina. See, I haven't even seen this slide. So this is one of the slides I haven't seen that Chilla created because I was cleaning up flood water all day. <laughs> and one of the things that we're doing is we want to know what we're managing as soon as we can. So the Slater track is something we just closed on, I think I said last Friday, uh, I think the Friday before last. Brand new property was bought by the Open Space Institute in Jasper County, uh, especially preserved gopher tortoises. Um, I think it's 12,000 acres. 
So our new botanist, Eric, is going there every month, exploring the property, mapping rare plants there. Um, so we know what we have on the property before we start to manage it. We know where to put fire breaks. We know where to do prescribed fires. We know what invasive plants to control. We know what to do with the property immediately. Um, Samantha is doing the same thing with Brass Town Creek Heritage Preserve, which a lot of, a lot of that's an old acquisition, but part of it is relatively new. So he's finding things like this parent, this little paranichia. What are the common names of paranichias? Sam and I don't know these things sometimes. It's a cute little, cute little, it's a cute little wildflower, but it was otherwise only known from one spot in the state. And he found it right there. He found the northernmost record of um, of uh, gopher apple, which we had known from Tillman Sandridge here to serve. And he found it here for the first time, the most uh, um, inland part of its range. So that's the Slater Tract on the Kusawachi River. Gorgeous property. Once we get them, we have to manage them. And this is a project that is still ongoing, but we're we're really happy about. There's still a lot of troubles. This is Sweet Mountain Pitcher Plant, Saracenia jonesii, which is endemic to the mountains of South Carolina and adjacent North Carolina. Um, it grows in this wonderful ecosystem called a mountain fen, just absolutely gorgeous, where creeks flow across granitic domes on the edge of the escarpment and form these little herbaceous wetlands along the edges of the creek. And it's sunny and there are butterflies and there are wildflowers. Unfortunately, I talked about fire earlier and fire in the mountains. Um, the thought is fires used to be a, a big part of the ecosystem across the escarpment. Forests dominated by things like Virginia pine and shortleaf pine, and now are unburned. And so our little herbaceous wetlands with butterflies and wildflowers are being overtopped by hardwood species, by woody plant species. So um, we did a little pilot project in 2020 on private property actually, where we just went in for a few hours and started cutting hardwoods. It's something other managers like Mary Bunch have done before. We were, um, this was near a heritage preserve. So where the thought is, well, let's get this population healthy and eventually we might be able to get it onto our heritage preserve and expand the population. So within um, a couple of months, we did this in the late winter, early spring, within a couple of months, went back, the pitcher plants were just doing fantastic. They were, their pitchers were skyrocketing. They were flowering. Grass of Parnassus, which is not a grass reminder, common names are stupid a lot of the time. This is a beautiful wildflower, absolutely gorgeous wildflower, Parnassia, popping up underneath it, first time seen on that property. So this is a property that hadn't been managed in decades and it responded immediately. And so we expanded that project, Samantha and a team and I went up with chainsaws and we're doing a lot of other properties too. So pitcher plants doing a little bit better. We've got other problems, but it's another, Sam will give that talk someday. Samantha and Jamie Marlow are making great finds in some of these ecosystems as a result of these ecosystem management techniques. I won't tell you what property this is, but this is a species last seen. This is bog orchid, last seen in South Carolina in the 1970s. It's back somewhere. I won't tell you where. Sam won't even tell me where it is. But uh, I, <laughs> I'm kidding. So, but the results of our land manager doing ecosystem restoration is having good results. And we're finding really pretty things that are really important for us. Bog orchid is, jumps down to South Carolina, almost over North Carolina. I think there's one spot for it in North Carolina. So it's a more Northern species. So it's back. And so Janie Marlowe and Sam's Eagle Eyes found that. But we also wanna put things back where they used to be. So we do some reintroductions. We're starting to, we wanna do more. We need the native plant society's help. So I mentioned Godfrey's privet earlier. We had a property called South Bluff Heritage Preserve with the Native American shell ring um, in Beaufort County. There were three males, it's dioecious. So those three males were lonely. So right around Thanksgiving week, or no, I mean, um, um, Valentine's week, we decided uh, to do something. So the problem is we had a bunch of females that we collected on another heritage preserve several years ago and they were grown out by South Carolina Botanical Gardens. So they were sitting in the ground ready for some transplantation, but we had to think about digging holes in an archaeological site. And I'm now 
saying if I ever need to dig a hole, I'm going to call it an archaeological site because I got our archaeologists to go. <laughs> and we cleared the vegetation first. We opened up some sunlight where the three males were. Our archaeology team came and did their excavations to document, document what was in this shell ring. They were actually astounded. They've been doing studies at Pocky Island um, on Botany Bay for several years, and they were finding more in a day of digging on this shell ring than they had at Pocky. We found an archaic spear point in that day. They dug our holes, which was great. It took them all day to dig seven holes. It was really hard for them. So Samantha and I and the site manager, Lewis, went back a couple of days later and took a bunch of females. We hope we need to catch them in flowers still and confirm and put them in the ground. And they're doing great. We went and checked on them this spring. They're happy. They're leafed out. They're not flowering yet. Um, but we hope that there's some romance. It blooms in February. So we hope by one of these Thanksgivings, they're going to get together with the males and they're going to have some babies. So that's what we want to see happen. Doing restoration. This is kind of a bigger picture dream uh, that the agency wants to do and I want to do. Um, trying to bring back some of our law, almost lost ecosystems like Piedmont prairies, which spread across the Piedmont of South Carolina and were frequently burned. Um, one of my big uh, interests is sandhill seepages. Um, we've nearly, among the fall line sandhills, we've got ecosystems that are on steep slopes where there's a hard pan and water comes out of a hillside. These are frequently burned ecosystems. Unfortunately, a lot of managers have a hard time burning them because they're often next to a creek or Pocosin that is hard to burn into. So we've got a couple of great examples of it at Fort Jackson, for example, in an artillery zone. So it's really hard to survey. Um, Carolina Sandhills National Wildlife Refuge. But we've got a lot of really special plants that grow in these seepage slopes, not only in the fall, fall line sandhills, but also sometimes in the um, outer coastal plain that have things like Sandhills lily. It's only known from South Carolina or North Carolina down to Georgia. Um, uh, Helenium brevifolium, brevifoli or brevifolium, I forget the common names. Um, it's one of the sneeze weeds. It's only known from one side in South Carolina with a lot of army artillery. <laughs> so it's hard to survey for. And Venus flytraps really likes this ecosystem too. But Helenium. It's also, well, Helenium is also known from Georgia, North Carolina, but it's only known from one side in South Carolina. Not Brevifolium, um, Helenium. Sorry, not Helenium, Baldwinia, Baldwinia atropurpurea. Yes, sorry. I usually know the scientific names instead of the common names, and I, I, I messed up this time. I'm tired. <laughs> And we're still tinkering around with naming some new species. Hopefully that'll be soon. So we've got some exciting stuff that we realized have never been named before in South Carolina. Um, this is one that John Nelson and I are working on. Sam has been surveying for it lately. <laughs> this is a hedge nettle that is only at and right next to Brasstown Creek Heritage Preserve. Um, right on Lake Tugaloo, it's never even been, oh, awesome. She was seeing it, what, this week? Yeah. Maybe last week. I don't know. <laughs> it's an amazing wildflower. It can be very tall when it gets a lot of sun. It's got this really musky fragrance. If you, it's got the stems are covered with glands. It's got this really musky fragrance. Really pretty flowers. The ecology is really interesting because we had all we've actually known about this thing since the 1960s or so, and people can never figure out what name to put on it because it didn't fit anything. And there's a reason for that because it's never been named. And most of the populations were found in roadsides. And the first population I went to look for, Chick Gaddy had seen like three days before and I went to find it and it had been bulldozed in those three days. But fortunately there's a lot more out there including on that same road. But it's weird that we've got this endemic species nowhere else in the world that's growing on roadsides. But we started to walk around the mountainsides above Lake Tugalo and it's got this really interesting ecology. In my quick glance that day, it loves tip up mounds. So when trees fall, it's almost exclusively growing on those old tip up mounds where it had some sun for a little while or in little scree stopes where there are canopy gaps. And then another exciting one that Eric Ungberg is leading, or Low Country Botanist, that he and I kind of came to a conclusion about the same time that it was probably something new. We've got this little sunflower in the 
Horry County, Horry County, South Carolina, and also in North Carolina. That we had a handful of specimens collected from the two states since the 1960s or so, 70s, and nobody had quite fit them in anything but this thing called Florida sunflower. I'm from Florida. Florida sunflower is this tall. <laughs> Big wide leaves. This thing is this tall with little skinny leaves. So this was never improperly called Florida sunflower. And so it's going to be called Waccamaw sunflower to the Waccamaw Indians. And we protected it at one of our heritage preserves. It's actually the best population in the world at Cartwell Bay Heritage Preserve in a pine savanna there, loamy pine savanna. So we're really proud of that. So we're really about the, one of the only stewards of the species in the world, once it gets named. Um, so when I gave this talk to the master gardeners, I had some musings to kind of challenge them to do some things. And I don't need to challenge you guys to do things because you're already doing them. <laughs> but obviously encouraging the master gardeners to plant native species, removing invasive species in any landscape you can, including your property, things like Chinese tallow tree, huge threats to biodiversity, not only not planting them, but removing them. Then DNR, by the way, is starting to do the same thing, and we're starting to remove invasive species from some of our landscapes, like Bradford pears, finally, cutting some of the first Bradford pears down on our property a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> I'm not against ornamentals and exotic species, as long as they're not invasive. They have an important role in landscape sometimes, too, as long as they're not bad actors. They can support pollinators. Just don't have them be invasive species. Um, Having these native plantings in your yards or other properties, even if you're in an isolated spot um, in the middle of downtown Myrtle Beach, they can be really critical pathways for pollinators to move into our across our landscapes from places like Lewis Ocean Bay Heritage Preserve. Think of a little butterfly flying out of Lewis Ocean Bay, Lewis Ocean Bay Heritage Preserve and seeing all houses and going, oh crap. So, but if you've got landscapes, if you have species that are larval food plants or um, that they can host on are really important to help pollinators and seed dispersers move between conservation lands. Um, because a lot of our endangered species populations are increasingly fragmented, even by things like Lake Jocassi, where research by people like Ashley Morris at Furman are finding that each little creek a lot of our rare plant species are genetically isolated from the next creek and often are big clones of just one plant. So cute little Oconee bells. Um, and a last little picture, you were some you were talking about Janet Harrison High Pond. This is Coryopsis, Coryopsis rosea and Harparella at Janet Harrison High Pond Heritage Preserve. So anyways, that's me. Hey, you got time for questions? I know. Any other questions in chat? Do you have time for questions? Any questions from the folks? I think it's a plant considered uh, naturalized. Like it was imported from Europe back in the 1600s. Now you go. It's actually not a perfect scale. Um, and we, we argue about, not necessarily argue, we ponder this a lot. And so you're familiar with Weekly's flora, the flora of the Southern United States, which is new additions are coming out about every year now. Alan Weekly, we've he's had conversations with this with probably dozens of people, including myself and Sam, about how to classify a lot of things. Because there's often a trajectory, a trajectory that we don't know or that we haven't seen. So we've had a lot of things that were, for example, collected as a ballast waif in the 1800s at a seaport like Charleston that never became established. And so we tend to put those in floras or people that write floras put them in, but more of a note saying, okay, this thing was collected in Charleston once in 1872. It didn't go anywhere. But then a lot of ornamental species that are starting to spread, you know, we can find things that are behind Riverbanks Garden, like sequoias. <laughs> <laughs> Strangely enough, you know, it might be a couple of plants, but we don't really know yet whether it's a self-sustaining population. Um, so we often have to make calls. Do you have a better answer to that question, Sam? I think it's really more of a question for, for the scientists themselves, but they can't call. Yeah. Um, 
and and we also look across the whole region, not just South Carolina, but looking at what what something's doing in North Carolina. Is it also doing starting to invade and you know it's starting to naturalize? Even if it's just around the parent trees and the parking lot, is it doing the same thing in North Carolina and Alabama? So we see patterns, but it's a huge problem in Miami because of the ornamental trade. Alan Weekly kind of once he expanded his floor down to South Florida, he kind of freaked out because there's just zillions of plant species that are natural, just barely starting to naturalize in South Florida because there's so many weird things planted there, be both by people at their houses or botanical gardens. Um, so he had to kind of force himself into dealing with a lot of those, but it's it's not a, there's no perfect answer. Question to you, Chad. Uh, what advice can you give about burning on private, urban, suburban property? Or an alternative to burning? There's no perfect alternative to burning. You can do things like mowing, brush cutting, but you're not providing many of the ecosystem services you do you would with a prescribed fire or a wildfire. Nature's going to burn the property if someday. And that's a lesson that Rick and I were joking around about, but it's very serious. Um, if a if you've got a fire prone ecosystem, it will burn someday, whether you want it to or not. Um, so the choice is, if you absolutely cannot have a fire, you can do things like hardwood control with hand tools or a mower or goats. But you're also not burning fine fuels. You're not you're opening up the ecosystem to sunlight, so that's good. But you're not burning fine fuels. You're not stimulating germination of fire dependent seeds. You're not stimulating flowering, a fire dependent species that are dependent on flowering for fire, uh, fire for flowering. Um, so it's it's it helps a little bit, but it's not a long term solution, actually, ecosystem restoration. And there are a lot of I'm not an expert on them, but in terms of private landowners, there are a lot of assistance program assistance programs. Like we work a lot with the U.S. Department of U.S. Depart U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, who has programs like Equip grants. Um, I'm forgetting some of the names NRCS. of them. NRCS to do help landowners do ecosystem restorations um, or hydrological restorations. So one of the things they help landowners pay for are fire breaks and prescribed fires. And they actually one of the big exciting projects we did this year that I was a part of, but. Sudi uh, Thomas with NRCS and Brett Beasley really led he, um, was helping private landowners with Venus flytraps. We went to a property that where Venus flytraps had been seen in the 1980s and never looked for again. And they were still there. It was our third known population in South Carolina. So we got really excited. They got involved. And we actually got a big burn done on private property this spring. And the flytraps are doing great. And a lot of other rare plant species too. So often if there's fly traps, there's a lot of other cool stuff. But um, yeah, so looking at programs like NRCS is really valuable for, for landowners to do burning. Anything to add to that, Sam? Yes, ask, what's the purple flower you picked in on the second to last page? Oh, that one? That one? Purple one, yeah, the top, I think. Stratoscantia spiderwort. Spider Oh, that's like oh, kind of gorgeous. Yeah, that was extreme macro. Okay. So that's mine. That was a 200 millimeter macro lens. So there's, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty isolated. So it's um in the uh, uh, Comaline AC family, uh, the uh, the day flower family. Um, gorgeous little native, bluish leaves. It's sold commonly by you know native plant nurseries, um, and absolutely beautiful. So and a little bit weedy, a little bit weedy, but you know, it's cute. This animal is a good mess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Bill asks, is iNaturalist the best way for us to capture data to help with species range mapping? It, iNaturalist is amazing for us. So we talk about, I actually had to pitch this in a budget meeting days ago, trying to get more help for our program. And that I, I cited the number, of, you know, we inherited about 9,000 data records. We are now getting on iNaturalist alone, we've got a project, Rare Plants of South Carolina on iNaturalist. We've got a lot of our rare plant species in. We need to add more because um, we're getting behind because we're adding so many rare species. We get on iNaturalist for those rare plants, 
about 800 records a year. And that's growing and growing. So in terms of our his legacy of botanical data overall in South Carolina is herbarium specimens. And on average in a year, botanists, I did a calculation across a decade, botanists collect two to 4,000 herbarium specimens a year in South Carolina. I think iNaturalist as of last year was generating about 50,000 plant records a year. There's a lot of chaff in there. You know, some of it's ornamental, some of it's misidentified, some of it can't be identified, but it's an extraordinarily important piece of data. So if you're finding rare plant data, we really want you to contact us because iNaturalist is an amazing spot for mapping it. And we are gonna be harvesting more and more data from it. iNaturalist will obscure data of rare species, but you can join our project and trust us with your, we're trustworthy, I promise. Uh, you can trust us with your coordinates of rare plant species. Um, so we can put them under our database and hopefully do some good with the data. Um, what iNaturalist doesn't necessarily capture is population data, like how many plants there were, how widespread was the population. Um, you know, it's a, often great pictures, but we also want, what are the threats? You know, what did you see? Were you next to a trail or, you know, um, does it need to be burned? There, there's other ancillary, ancillary data that we would love if you just talk to us. So, yeah. We did. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's more in chat, but. Yeah. Steve. South Carolina Avenue's regulations for protection of state listed plants. I know in Florida, you cannot collect the state listed plants. So, we don't. <laughs> All right, so, so Steve asked, what are the regulation? What, what legislation is there in South Carolina to protect rare plant species? So for example, in Florida, there's in a lot of states, about half the states in the country have endangered species ordinances um, on a state-by-state -state basis. So in South Carolina, we don't have anything specific to the state. The only thing that protects rare plant species in South Carolina is the U.S. Endangered Species Act which is not very effective for the most part in protecting plants because it treats plants differently than animals. And animals are considered, this goes back to kind of European and British property law, animals are considered public property. So if you've got a bald eagle on your property, well, not anymore, but if you've got an endangered animal on your property, it's considered public property and you're not allowed to do anything to that animal um, without getting in a lot of trouble if somebody finds out. With a plant, if you owned coneflower on your property or dwarf or heart, heart leaf, you can go out and herbicide it or bulldoze it or do whatever you want because it's considered your own property. The only exception to that is if there's some kind of federal nexus, some kind of federal, and Steve knows all this, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Steve, if there's some kind of federal funding or action involved like staff, um, then it invokes the Endangered Species Act. So we are able to protect a lot of rare plant species on places like national forests or national parks or, um, military bases are really important um, because they have to abide by the Endangered Species Act. South Carolina does not have any legislation protecting any plant species with two small exceptions. You're not allowed to harvest sea oats without a permit, harvest sea oats without a permit. In the same legislation, the same sentence where we protect sea oats, we protect Venus flytraps, but it's only a misdemeanor in South Carolina to collect Venus flytraps. So, one more question. We have one more question. We have a couple on chat. Yeah. Um, Dennis asked, "What natives do you recommend for floodplains as I eradicate Chinese privet?" Goodness. <laughs> well, good, good for her. Yeah. <laughs> And when we talk about you know, doing these invasive plant control, it's not just removing a new invader from the landscape. Something like Chinese privet, it, it's changing the whole function and structure of the ecosystem because it's not only shading out other species that normally a lot of these creeks would have normally been a little bit sunnier or had a lot of herbaceous species like sedges that Samantha likes, um, it shades all of those out, but it also has high rates of evapotranspiration. So it actually dries out ecosystems as well. So it's not only out competing things, but changing the functions of the ecosystem. Um, and while I've been talking, I've been hoping that Samantha is coming up with some ideas. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
you know, I would say that's not necessarily what, what you put back. By removing the invasives, some the landscape itself will come back. You know, just like up the up the uh, the Blackwell Heritage Preserve yeah. Travis Rest, you know, with you know, with the bunched airhead, what we're seeing is that we're removing this privet and the habitat is coming back really, really quickly. Also at Stevens Creek, where we did year after year with Mary Bunch down there pulling privet, that habitat has came back with a roaring because we didn't plant anything. The habitat came back because we removed the invasive. And he's absolutely right. So I, I end up, one of the things I don't like about my job is I'll end up having to review mitigation plans sometimes and it ends up having plantings. And a lot of times you just need to remove the exotics and see what happens. And that's often all you need. Um, but things, you know, there are things like river oats and things that you could put in. Yeah. So dog hobble. dog hobble would be great. It depends on where you are in the state. Yeah. So. Uh, Samantha is suggesting spice bush, especially if it's in the mountains or Piedmont. Um, I always draw a blank on this question. I apologize, but because um, I'm not used to doing the installations myself. <laughs> well, you mentioned, so, and I don't know what's available in yeah, nurseries. So, Chasmanthium, uh, yeah. River Oats is wonderful, and Dog Hobble is another good one there. Spice, uh, the spice bush is great. Uh, they're just a, you know, again, I go back to the habitat will landscape mm -hmm. itself if you manage properly, you know. So, uh, but at certain times when you have so much disturbance, you have to go back with something. You know, and then there's a lot of sedges. Uh, some of our sedges are really good as well. And uh, so I'm a, se I'm a Patrick Millen sedge guy. And uh, so, you know, we like to use sedges. And, you know, so uh, we found sedges is a really good yeah. um, introducer as well. And there's a whole host of native sedges that work. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Phil, so I have one last question. Uh, does fire dependent flowering and germination be successfully triggered when simulated conditions? Yes, however, I'm not sure how good it can be done on a wide scale. So example, if you pour, I work with an endangered little wildflower, a polygola, in the genus polygola, and polygola doesn't exist anymore as of today, I think, um, <laughs> in, South, in the United States. Uh, it was, it's a biennial, and if you pour uh, water that's been uh, infused with smoke, then it'll actually stimulate germination, whereas just plain water will not stimulate germination. So stimulating, um, doing treatments like mowing can often trigger some things to flower, um, but I don't think anything nearly as widespread as actually a good old fashioned scorching hot fire. Good. All right, thank you, Keith. Thank You're you welcome. so much. You need this stuff? Yeah.